Our scripture reading this morning is in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Yeah, thank you, Dave. One life to live. The scripture that Dave read says to me that God loves us so much that he regards us as his children, but the world does not know us because it does not value what he did for the world. Shall we pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, help us to appreciate the love that you have for us. Your love and faithfulness sustain us. We cannot truly have life without it. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Thank you, Father, for providing this sermon, that we may be blessed as we are drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To a thousand generations, he says. One person online did a genealogic study, and he figured that from Adam to his children today, there have been somewhere around 88 to 104 generations. When you think of it that way, it hasn't been that long since the beginning. Certainly, he is faithful. We are so valuable. We are born to greatness because God loves us. If you have just one of something, it can be very valuable and precious to you because there is no replacement for it. I'm talking about something that is so important to us ourselves. In life, we direct our efforts towards what is most important to us. If we live for the world and strive after its rewards, we are going to be disappointed. And that will be the, uh, the sad story of a life that did not respond to the master's invitations. But a Christian has the right perspective on this life and he also has a blessed hope for the life to come. A Christian realizes that he is very important, not because of any virtue in himself. He is valuable because he is important to God, and his love for us is unfathomable. It is unfathomable in that it is too great to be measured, and it is unfathomable because it cannot be understood. Under his leadership, we are able to become new creatures after the divine similitude, for by beholding what we adore, we become changed. As we respond to his love, we cannot help but be a wellspring of love and life to others. God has graciously provided us with life itself, with opportunities, with the knowledge that we were specially created after his own likeness and character, in fact. But the sad situation for 6,000 years is that we have been alienated from our Creator. We are the prodigal children. Our souls yearn to be reconciled to him and to fill the role in this life and the next that he has designed for us. He has designed that we shall possess the character of God by obeying his law, which is the expression of his divine character. The Lord has given us mind, intellect, and affections. These gifts are entrusted to us to be exercised and improved. Each of us has a unique, special, God-given role to fill. We are individuals, different from one another, but free to decide how we will relate to our God and the natural world 
as well as the other intelligent beings that God provides for our temporal needs and fulfillment. Each of us wants the best that life has to offer. What are the best things in life? The best things are enduring. The best things are truly what they say they are. The best things will not disappoint us. The best things are for the uplifting and restoration of mankind. The best things are spiritual, and they bear the seal of God. God's things never change. The best things are free, yet they are priceless, for they come from the heart of God and not the designs of men. The best things are those that moth or rust do not corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. The best things truly come from God, and he is our surety that these things are true, and we will not be disappointed. Scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. If you have grown up indoctrinated in the things of this world, you may have been led to a turning point in your life in which you realize that what the world says it is, is not what you found it to be. And you discover that spiritual matters must surely transcend the cares of the temporal world which contains so much trouble and contradiction. And even though our bodies are still bound to the earth, we may live with renewed purpose and vigor when our souls have been illuminated by the truth and there is no turning back to our former selves. As the things of earth grow strangely dim and as we excitedly await the Lord's return, we eagerly share the good news with others what has given our lives a purpose that it did not have before. And someday the Lord will make all things right, on tr right and true on earth as it is in heaven, and nothing between now and then can take us away from our life that we find in him. We have learned these things, and they have been our source of joy and freedom ever since. As the disciples said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? The scriptures open before us the way to life, that is, our spiritual, our real life. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. The troubles that assail us now, they will pass away. Let us look forward to better things, not with our natural vision, but with the eye of faith, whereby our hopes and our lives are sustained by the promises that God wants to fulfill in us. He seeks to awaken us to the greater reality that lies beyond our daily routine. He beckons us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these temporal things will be added unto you. We cannot take credit for any good that we may do in life. It is when we step aside to let God use us according to his good pleasure and not the perverse will of man that something truly worthwhile is accomplished. The Apostle Paul said, We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God chooses human beings, men full of weaknesses, to accomplish his plans. The priceless treasure is placed in earthen vessels through men. His blessings are to be carried to the world. Through him, his glory is to shine forth into the darkness of sin in our lives and the world. In loving ministry, we are to meet the sinful and the needy and lead them to the cross. And in all our work, we are to ascribe glory 
honor, and praise to him who is above all and over all. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is where we find our glory. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. These things were not written to discourage us, but to help us recognize clearly that goodness is not found in men. We need to give up on ourselves in order to discover ourselves that we're created to be in harmony with Christ, childlike in our complete dependence on our Lord, the only one whose grace is sufficient to save us. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. We have the story of the despised little man named Zacchaeus. To Zacchaeus the Savior said, This day is salvation come to this house. Not only was Zacchaeus himself blessed, but all his household with him. They had been shut out from the synagogues by the contempt of rabbis and worshipers, but now his was the most favored household in all Jericho, for they gathered in their own home around the divine teacher and heard the words of life. When Christ is received as a personal savior, salvation comes to the soul. Zacchaeus had received Jesus, not as a passing guest, but as one to abide in the soul temple. Blessed be the name of the Lord, who faithfully strives with men and holds back the full force of the winds of strife to extend our opportunities to learn and share with others about the truth of life as it is found in Jesus. The Lord says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. As a child takes the hand of his parent and trusts him implicitly, so we also need to learn to rely on our Heavenly Father. For in truth, we can do nothing without him. He created all things and he sustains all things. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. The graceful forms and delicate hues of the flowers may be imitated by the artist but what touch can impart life to even one blade or flower? Every, every blossom owes its existence to the same power that set the starry worlds on high. Through all created beings thrills one pulse of the life of the great heart of God. Although sin has marred God's perfect work, his handwriting remains. Even today, all created things bear the glory of his excellence. There is nothing except for the selfish heart of man that lives for itself. Every bird that divides the air, every animal that moves upon the ground, ministers to some other life. Every leaf of the forest or common blade of grass has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth oxygen, without which neither man nor animal could live, and man and animal in turn minister to the life of the tree and the shrub and the leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes so that it may give. The mists ascending from its bosom 
fall in showers to water the earth so that it may bring forth and bud. The angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love and tireless care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. And by gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into a fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Are your thoughts troubled today? Wouldn't you like them to be in another place? A place where there is no trouble. This thought alone should quiet our tendency to think so much of ourselves and cause us to wait quietly and with humility upon the Lord in reverence and awe. We should have a greater appreciation for our great God who first loved us and he gives us a universe of good reasons to rejoice. For he is the great I am, almighty God, the author and finisher and guarantor of our faith. And there is none like him who alone may say, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. What might be said of us mortals is that we have chosen the better thing, like Mary of Bethany, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. We cannot know the future, and neither is it important for us to know the future, but we are invited to rely upon the one who is the master of the future. He has the future in the palm of his hand, and he bids us, Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take care for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Victorious Stephen. At his martyrdom, Stephen gave, had calm assurance in God. The priests and rulers were beside themselves with anger. Acting more like beasts of prey than human beings, they rushed upon Stephen, gnashing their teeth. In the cruel, inhuman faces about him, the prisoner read his fate. But he did not waver. For him the fear of death was gone. The enraged priests and the excited mob caused him no terror. In fact, the scene before him faded from his vision. To him the gates of heaven were opened, and he saw the glory of the courts of God. And Christ, as he had just stood up from his, phone, from his throne, standing there ready to sustain his servant. In words of triumph, Stephen exclaimed, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Stephen might well have said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. As Stephen described the glorious scene, it was more than his persecutors could endure. Covering their ears so they would not hear him, and crying loudly all at once, they ran furiously upon him and threw him out of the city. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Where have we heard that? And when he said this, 
he fell asleep. Stephen grasped what was essential in life. In Stephen's martyrdom, do you see victory or do you see defeat? Do you see hope? Or do you see a life of despair that ended in a most dreadful manner, being murdered by a crazed crowd? To an unbeliever, our lives are a journey, a mysterious, foreboding journey of random circumstances and unknown gods in uncharted waters. To a believer, life is an exercise of faith in which we are invited to discern God's lessons for us. And in those lessons, we will perceive his goodness and love toward us and his majesty and his faithfulness time and time again. How can anything bad come from a good God? This thought has been on my mind for some time. We know that everything that happens in this life is only what he allows. Everything that God allows to happen to us is for our good. We may live with assurance and confidence in the goodness of God, but if we're rebellious, then of course there will be consequences. But even then, the uncomfortable consequences that God allows are intended to humble us so that we might at last be saved. And through it all, we may rest in the fact of his concern and love for us. So is that okay with you? Do you consent for God to allow some timely lessons to come your way so that your life can be pointed again in the right direction? When his lessons are received as they are intended, we may perceive the inter interventions of God seeking to save us from our follies. Is the pain of childbirth worth enduring? Is studying worth the effort so we can pass a test? or so we can get a job that we need to have. Everything is good in God's world, and we may follow him to the realms beyond. Romans 8:18. 8, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If we follow the ways of the world, we can expect to be disappointed because the world is not focused on and it cannot give us the fulfillment in Christ for whom we were created. The carnal mind of all men is naturally at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Definitions of enmity include everything bad, deep-seated dislike, hate, intense hostility, the state of being an enemy. We acknowledge that there is an undercurrent of evil in the world. We see it in the world around us, and we see it in ourselves. It is frustrating, to say the very least. Like a soldier who finds himself behind enemy lines, we are surrounded by unfriendly forces. We can never let our guard down, and we need to stay close to our leader. Only he will give us safe passage through this minefield. Sometimes God knows that we need hard lessons to bring us to a place in our hearts where we're willing to listen and rely upon him instead of listening to the clamoring and confusion in our own minds. These low points in our lives are okay. God has not forsaken us at those times. Like receiving an injection in the arm, we don't look forward to the hard experience, but we do look forward to being restored. God is perfect, but we, on the other hand, would do well to consider ourselves as lumps of clay, willingly giving ourselves to be fashioned by the hand of the Master according to His good pleasure, and not what we may imagine or feel is best. But now, O oh Lord, Thou art our Father, and we are the clay, and Thou art our potter, and we are all the work of Your hand. He showed Thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of Thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, 
and to walk humbly with thy God. This is our proper place in life. Ah, the simple, pure faith of a child. It's refreshing to look at the experience of the child Samuel. Inspiration tells us that God could not communicate with the high priest and his sons because their sins had shut out the Holy Spirit. But in the midst of the evil surrounding him, Samuel remained true to heaven. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, supposing the voice to be Eli's. The child hastened to the bedside of the priest, saying, Here am I, for thou callest me. The answer was, I called not my son, lie down again. Three times Samuel was called, and thrice he responded the same way. And then Eli was convinced that the mysterious call was the voice of God. The Lord had passed by his chosen servant, the elderly Eli, to commune with a child. This in itself was a bitter yet deserved rebuke to Eli and his house. But no envy or jealousy was awakened in his heart. He directed Samuel to answer, if he called again, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Once more the voice was heard, and the child answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. He was so awed at the thought that God could speak to him personally that he did not remember the exact words. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew about, because his sons were vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of his house shall never be purged with sacrifice or offering. Before receiving this message from God, Samuel was not acquainted with such direct manifestations of God's presence like the prophets received. It was the Lord's purpose to reveal himself in such an unexpected manner so that Eli might hear of it through the surprise and questioning of a child. Samuel was filled with fear and amazement at the thought of being responsible for such a heavy message. In the morning he went about his duties as usual, but with a heavy burden upon his young heart. The Lord had not commanded him to reveal the fearful denunciation, so therefore he remained silent, avoiding Eli as much as possible. He trembled lest he be required to tell what God had said against one whom he loved and reverenced. Eli was confident that the message foretold some great calamity to him and his house, but he called Samuel and told him that he needed to faithfully report what God had revealed. The youth obeyed and the aged man bowed in humble submission to the dreadful sentence. It is the Lord, he said. Let him do what he seems is good. I appreciate how the simple faith of a child can avail much. And so we also are to have a childlike faith of total reliance upon our Heavenly Father. Sometimes we may be tempted to ask, what claims does the Lord have on me? We need to look around us. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. You gave him dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. 
all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the sea. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And Psalm 107 says, O oh, that men should praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. That they wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. There are precious promises in God's word. We don't realize the spiritual growth that we can have when we become partakers of the divine nature. Every day we can have victories and grow into wise, strong men and women in Christ. He who has become a partaker of the divine nature knows that his citizenship is above. He is inspired by the Spirit of Christ. His soul is hid with Christ in God and Satan can no longer manipulate such a person who has become the very temple of God. He gains victories at every step. He is filled with noble thoughts and he regards every other human being as precious because Christ died for every soul. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. The man who waits upon the Lord is strong enough to hold firm against any pressure, yet he knows mercy and compassion like that of Christ. The soul that is submissive to God is ready to do the will of God. He diligently and humbly seeks to know his will. He accepts discipline and is afraid to walk according to his own judgment. He communes with God and his conversation is in heaven. Linked to the infinite one, man is made partaker of the divine nature. Upon him, evil will have no effect, for he is clothed with the full measure of Christ's righteousness. And if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for being who you are. Help us to trust that you always have our best interest at heart, no matter how things look so dark. We are so short-sighted sometimes, and our lives are challenging. But help us to trust in your goodness to bring us through, and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.